Welcome to the third of my series as Gresham Professor of Music. As I've often said standing here, I recognize a number of you. Thank you for coming back. It's always very flattering, as you can imagine, to a lecturer, lecturer when someone comes back a second time or even a third. So there are some familiar faces here. Welcome back. To those of you who are new to my series, I'm very pleased to meet you. Do come up afterwards and uh, have a word with me if you'd like to and discuss anything that you think I've got wrong or right as your lights inform you. Now imagine, if you will, a string quartet playing on stage, a violins, a viola, and a cello. Let your imagination play over the wonderfully warm colors and exquisite curves of those instruments. You all know them. Pieces of musical technology that in many respects haven't changed for centuries. Now let the eye of your imagination play over the bows. They're so familiar that perhaps you don't see anything very unusual about them. And yet, whenever a string quartet gives a recital of the kind I'm asking you to imagine, perhaps featuring works that many regard as masterpieces of Western musical art, they're producing their sound with one of the most basic materials of the Asian equestrian nomadic horseman, horsehair and a piece of wood. Bows strung with the tails of horses momentarily bring the world of skin tents and fermented mare's milk into a happy coincidence with Beethoven's late quartets. Then perhaps you might glance at the music which the players have on the stands before them. Each one is reading from musical notation on a five-line stave. Or oh, they're very likely to be doing so unless they're playing some very recent composition indeed. That staff is a legacy from the song schools of the 11th century, for in its most familiar form, as you know it, with five parallel lines. It records the octave with a few extra notes on either side that medieval singers of plain song were required to supply. To put it another way, the musical stave we all use bears the imprint of what was needed nearly a thousand years ago. Well, these two inventions, the musical bow and the staff, may have far-flung sources indeed. For all we know, because we don't see the bow represented in uh, Greek or Roman painting, frescoes or sculpture, for all we know, the bow came as early as the 5th century AD, long before there's any pictorial record of it, when Attila rode westward with his Asian Hunnic archers, looking for regular rations and a high command in the Roman army, which Attila eventually found. As for the musical staff, well, who knows? It may owe something to the scholars of 10th century Italy, who first learned to move counters marked with Hindu Arabic numerals on an abacus. Looked at another way, our musical staff is actually a graph, and one of the earliest manifestations of the graph principle, I think, that we know of. In other words, you see where I'm, what I'm driving at. As musicians, there is a very, very long history to what we do, which we're not always aware of. Well, in these lectures, I'm going to be looking far back by asking who the singers in the Christian churches were, what we can know about their lives, how they performed, and the ways in which they were organized. So let me say at once, because clearly I must, that only towards the very end of the period with which I'll be concerned does any decipherable music survive only towards the very end. For the greater part, there's either nothing written down or nothing we can decipher, but we can, of course, make something of that. It's not just a complete absence. Singers must have learned their material by heart, or they extemporized it. They simultaneously, if you like, composed and delivered it. 
their need for musical notation emerged only very slowly, and in many cases they didn't have one. Their form of singing, in other words, was a form of life. Well, I shall be choosing musical illustrations from the rich legacy of later medieval chant as a constant reminder, if you like, of what we're working towards and of the underlying vocal and sonorous reality of our subject, a matter of ears and throats before it is a matter of pens and ink. Today, Chris will mostly be singing chants for a single feast, the first Sunday in Advent, which of course is the next great liturgical season that lies before us since we're meeting here in early October. But I've asked him to begin so that we can adjust our ears, so to speak, with a reminder of the simplest and perhaps the most ancient form of psalmody, recitation on a single pitch with a closing inflection. This is part of the psalm Confite Mini Domino, which contains the words, appropriately enough, cantate, epsalite, ei, sing and praise him. Confite Mini Domino et invocate nomen Annunciate intergentes opera eus. Cantate et psalite ei. Meditamini in omnibus mirabilibus eus. Laudamini in nomine sancto eus. Let it work or call when see um domino. Querit et dominum et potentia meus. Querit et facie meus semper. Mementot et mirabidium meus que feci. Prodigia eus et judicia oris eus. Semen Abraham servi eus. Fidi Jacob electi eus. Although I shall be emphasizing the importance of Christian worship, to the development of Western music, I, I don't mean, I really don't mean to commandeer the musical tradition of the Occident for any particular group, I, I don't. Nor do I want to suggest that Western music developed in some kind of ethnic or cultural enclosure. It seems to me that, and I hope by the end of this series, if you stay with me, I will convince you of it, that by recognizing the importance of the Christian heritage to our music, we actually trace the roots of it down to Eastern Mediterranean levels in antiquity, where singers in the service of many different cultic groups and of many different kinds of ethnicity are taking their place beside the psalmists of the Jewish gatherings and the hymnodists that sang for the cults of Isis, Mithras, and other strange gods. All these singers, I suspect, shared a common wealth of musical techniques. I can imagine that if you were to go, for example, to an ancient Eastern Mediterranean city like Dura Europos, go down that narrow alley, and there are four or five different cults that have got their cult centers, and there's song coming out of those. Go down that alley, and there's four or five different cults you can, as it were, have your pick in this great supermarket of cults, and there is a kind of commonality of musical style and idiom between them. And after all, there's very little suggestion in early Christian documents that there was a distinctively Christian way of singing. There may have been, in fact, there certainly were many Christian, distinctively Christian ways of doing things, but singing at first, at least, doesn't seem to have been one of them. And one of the things I find most exciting about this subject, which I hope to communicate to you, is the wonderfully rich background of communications it has, sea lanes and roadways. Consider for a moment, I'll take you on a slight detour, a text called the Res Gestae, the things done, issued by the Roman emperor, the first Roman emperor, 
Augustus. It's his official account of his achievements intended for public display in a sculptural form. It's really quite magnificent in its arrogance and its ultimate models are the great inscriptions of Darius, Xerxes and the Persians. The text proclaims, for example, the success of Augustus in pacifying territory from Cadiz to the mouth of the Elbe and for imposing an administration that allowed his officials to mount three great enrollments for taxation. In these and many other declarations, Augustus gave passers-by in Rome and other cities much to ponder. But few, I think, would have suspected that one of his imperial enrollments would soon figure in the history of a very different ruler. And I quote, and it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria and all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. I'm sure you recognize the passage from the Gospel of Luke. The impression of historical precision there, the dating of events by reference to an imperial census and the governorship of Cyrenius, is very characteristic of Luke's writing in what I think we can call, as many people do, his two-volume history of early Christianity, which we know as, of course, Luke's Gospel and the Acts of the Apostles, which is widely but not universally assumed to be by him. In both, but especially in Acts, Luke conveys a vivid sense of the Eastern Mediterranean under Roman governance. The Gazetteer of cities, ports, and provinces dispersed through Acts of the Apostles is actually bigger than the one the Emperor Augustus needs to proclaim his triumphs. Not counting roads and other locations in Rome, there are 50 names of places in Augustus' proclamation, but Luke uses significantly more. He mentions Roman provinces, Asia, Bithynia, Galatia. Great cities appear, Antioch, Ephesus, Caesarea Maritima, Corinth, Sidon, and Tyre. The tradition of Western classical music, in the widest sense of the term classical, bears the marks of its long evolution in the curious assembly of peninsulas, islands, and creeks that we commonly call Europe, but also beyond that, in the Eastern Mediterranean, including the richest provinces of Roman Africa. I shall come back soon to Tunisia. Well, today, in this first lecture of the series, I'd like to spend a little time getting our bearings, beginning with what might be called the Christian commitment to music. And we obviously begin with the Jews. Surprising as it may seem, Jews and Christians in many Mediterranean cities maintained some form of festive and cultic contact into at least the fourth century AD, four centuries after the crucifixion, in other words. So I think it's important not to allow our sense of the early church, the very early church, to slide back into the older view that it became overwhelmingly Gentile very quickly with great rapidity leading to an early parting of the ways in singing as in other things. That's precisely the position that much recent research tries to combat by emphasizing, in fact, that what we have is uh, two sibling commitments which are closely related to one another for some considerable time. This means that the history of Christian negotiations with any music used when Jews gathered as Jews is not necessarily a story of influence followed by independent Christian development. We'd be looking instead for an evolving relationship in the matter of ritual singing between, as I say, sibling commitments during some 400 years. It's worth remembering what I'm sure everyone here already knows. Clearly, the first people to call themselves Christians, in, in using the, the Greek term Christians, are, are Jews who believe that they have seen the destiny of the Jewish people come to fruition and that the anointed one, uh, the Messiah, Christ, has actually come. So you could argue that the first Jew Christians under that name who appear in Antioch 
in the 70s and 80s AD are actually more Jewish than other Jews because they think they've seen Jewish de just destiny come to fruition. It's a very complex issue is who is a Christian and who is a Jew at this particular time. Well, there are many signs that Christians between the first century and the fourth were rethinking some fundamental categories of social and political life in the Eastern Mediterranean. But they didn't wander so far from the heritage of Jewish psalmody in the home or in the polytheistic, if you prefer, pagan temple as to suppose that their gatherings should be without song. After all, Christians hoped, or many did, some still do, that the righteous would eventually stand in some form of bodily and physical life before the throne of God where the only imaginable alternative to ecstatic praise was the disobedience of Satan and the rebel angels. Many of you will know the wonderful passage in Milton's Paradise Lost where Satan says in effect, I am not going to spend the rest of eternity warbling alleluias to God. He will not serve. He becomes the great rebel angel. Christians were therefore making a pilgrimage through a temporary world which was not their true home, and that's still, of course, effectively Christian doctrine, to an eternal liturgy where they really belonged. The kingdom of God was at hand. That's a conspicuous part, isn't it, of the teaching of Jesus of Nazareth. It's already begun, and they should start their liturgy now in preparation for the time when they will stand with the angels or sit at the eternal banquet. Well, allusions to the psalmody, the singing of Christian groups, already appear in the New Testament and continue with references by early authors such as Tertullian, active round about the, the year 200 and writing in Carthage and therefore in what is now Tunisia, references by Tertullian to the practices of families and households convened for worship in private homes. For anything beyond community singing, a kind of common hymnody, it must already have mattered who the singers were. That presumably always has mattered. And by the fourth century, some of the wealthier cathedrals in Eastern Asia Minor already acknowledged a ministry of ritual song, although the bishops of the churches were not inclined to give the singers too much status, and certainly not as much as they desired. It's as early as the fourth century, the long history of the church's very ambivalent relationship with its singers had begun. And I'll be devoting uh, the next lecture in this series to that question of the emergence of a ministry of song. Information for the later centuries of the Western Empire is in many places thin, but by about 500, it's there. There is a ministry of song. Come next time and you'll hear more. But even when the traces of singers before that are fragmentary, as they generally are, and this is the other thing that seems to me to be intriguing about this subject, not just, as it were, the wonderfully rich tapestry of communication, sea lanes and roadways that underlies it, but also this. The evidence we have for the way singers were recruited and the, who they were can rarely be made to accord with the familiar model of a declining and falling Roman Empire. Well, there are still some echoes of Edward Gibbon's famous book, as you will know it, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, notably in the book by Brian Ward Perkins from as recently as 2005 called The Fall of Rome and the End of Civilization. And he argues that the Vandals, the Goths, and the other incomers are often presented today by historians as Pacific incomers who oversaw a mutation of late Roman government rather than as invaders or despoilers, rather than as a barbarian horde, which is how they used to be regarded. And he has a point. But there's much to be said, I think, for viewing the new kings in those kingdoms which have in solution, so to speak, the nation states of Europe that we still understand and still live with. There's much to be gained from viewing the kings in Spain, 
Gaul, or France if you prefer, and Italy, as the indigenous populations must often have seen them, namely as Romano barbarians of the kind that the empire had long been accustomed to employ. You've probably all seen the film Gladiator, which begins with a, a, a spectacular battle between a very well-equipped and well-disciplined Roman army and uh, a, a barbarian army in a Germanic forest. They all look as though they've been sleeping rough for 20 years. Of course, in actuality, many of the Roman generals would probably be, have been of German extraction themselves, since the army was thoroughly barbarized by that time, and the Romans drew upon uh, people from all over the empire for their army. And I suspect that the character played by Russell Crowe wouldn't have been called Maximus Decimus Meridius, but something like Stilicho. He'd have, been a, he'd have been a German, probably. It's Germans fighting Germans. So a king, for example, like Clovis, king of the Franks, who died in 511, a major figure, of course, for the French far right, the Front National, because he is held up as the founder of a Catholic France, Clovis. He emerges really from recent research nothing like the scarcely tamed figure of some romantic painting, where he's often shown entering the baptismal font to become a Christian, still holding his axe and with the long hair of his dynasty flowing. In fact, recent research makes this so-called barbarian really looked like a, a Roman general who spoke a barracks Latin, who reviewed his troops in the Roman manner on a parade ground, and who inherited the administratio, the administration of a Roman province. This is the kind of mixed Romano-barbarian context where much of the evidence for singers and their activities will turn up. Let's begin our progress through the chants for the first Sunday in Advent. The first, of course, is the introit for coming in to the church, ad te levavi. And it offers a reminder of where the fountainhead of the earliest Christian music surely lies. And some would say the fountainhead of European love lyric lies. I mean, of course, the Psalms. This one uses Psalm 24, unto you, I have lifted up my soul. O oh my God, I have trusted in you. Let me not be put to shame. And like many chants of this kind, you'll hear how it encases the kind of monotone recitation we heard a little while ago. There's free melody, then the singer pauses a little, and then the monotone begins with the words, Vias tuas domine, demonstra michi, make your ways known unto me, O Lord. Ad te levavi, anima meam, Deus meus in te confide. 
I've been using the terms Christian and Christianity rather too freely, you might think, and you may be right. During the second half of the 20th century, with the intensification especially of New Testament scholarship, it became ever more apparent that terms such as Christianity, the church, orthodoxy, are to some extent retrospective constructions imposed upon a very diversified landscape of cults and practices. I'm not suggesting, by the way, that the form of Christianity that went on to become Catholicism was simply one amongst many competing versions of Christianity that for various reasons happened to win out. I'm not saying that, but I am saying that the early Christian cults were very, very varied and included many competitors. And something similar could be said for the issue of Jewish as opposed to Gentile identity, or for heretical as opposed to mainstream Christians. And texts reflecting forms of Christian belief once regarded as plainly heretical or marginal, such as the so-called apocryphal Gospels and Acts. You all know, of course, that there are many Gospels that didn't make it into the New Testament, and there are many letters and Acts that didn't make it. These apocryphal texts, as they're often called, have attracted a lot of fresh attention in recent years and have begun to appear in very handsome modern critical editions. Some of them, such as the Acts of John or the Acts of Paul, which were never received into the canonical New Testament, are important documents for ritual singing amongst at least some of those who regarded themselves as Christians. And while the history of the Acts of John is distinctly checkered, the Acts of Paul, not in the New Testament of course, circulated as part of an influential Pauline dossier for about 400 years after the crucifixion and was widely accepted as authentic. So when do we first meet a group of Christian singers, the distant ancestors of the medieval clerics who sang music like the chants we're hearing, when? Well, one answer is that they're there already in 1 Corinthians. In a rapid conspectus of the materials that believers bring to their religious assemblies, apparently on their own initiative, the author of this epistle, widely of course assumed to be Paul, Saul of Tarsus, mentions that each one has a psalm a teaching, a revelation, a tongue, and an interpretation. There's a sense here, of course, of fervent worship that Paul doesn't entirely approve of, animated by pneumatic, spiritually inspired acts of speaking and presumably singing in tongues, that is, in some strange language, and prophecy. And Paul thinks that the worship of these Corinthians is not properly cautious in the display of spiritual gifts, especially when it's women who display them. And there's perhaps an implication that the Corinthians bring the various elements of the service, including whatever they might sing, to the table, so to speak, in, in almost the literal sense of that expression, according to their own impulses cho and choice. Well, after 1 Corinthians, one of the most intriguing of the early sources appears actually outside the New Testament. During the brief period when Pliny the Younger was the governor of Bithynia and Pontus from the year 111 to 112, he interrogated a group of Christian prisoners to satisfy himself that they'd not offended against his recent edict banning clubs. He was afraid that they might become political conventicles. And he, of course, he had to report on this eventually to the emperor, Trajan. And Pliny records in his reply that these Christian captives brought before him gave an account of their meetings. They said that they convened before dawn on Sundays when they were accustomed to have a hymn of praise that Pliny calls a carmen. And they met frequently to share a common meal. What might surprise you when you read the document, some of you may already have done so, is how concerned these Christians were to let it be known that they were not cannibals. 
<clears throat> this is not merely because cannibalism and sodomy and other things were commonly thought to be the activities of cultic groups that met in secret. It's because, of course, the early Christians knew the words of institution associated with the last, what's called the Last Supper of Christ. Christians indulged in theophagy, the eating of their God, and I suspect that's what's behind the uh, charge of cannibalism. Excuse me. <clears throat> like many others in the first and second centuries, Pliny thought the Christians were very odd indeed, very strange, and so they were in many respects, but they were not so strange that they repudiated the use of ritual singing. Pliny, you'll notice, speaks of their carmen, which should be the normal Latin word for a poem or a song. Like Roman pagans with their processional hymns as they paraded to the temples, or the Jews with their temple psalmody, until, of course, the destruction of the temple by the Romans in AD 70, Christians knew the power of the singing voice to lift the mind to the heights of joy or carry it to the depths of lamentation. Jesus Christ is sung in your harmony and symphonic love, wrote Pliny's contemporary St. Ignatius to the church of Ephesus while he was being taken to Rome for martyrdom. And each of you should join the chorus. Well, how did they sing? The early texts can contain, in fact, some surprising answers. In a previous uh, series of lectures, indeed in my series last year, I mentioned the passage in the apocryphal Acts of John where before the Last Supper, Jesus rises from the table and asks the apostles to stand round him in a circle. They then begin to dance around him, responding Amen to each verse of the song he sings. I suspect there's some involvement here with the dances of Jews on Shabbat, which are recorded from about the same period. Because the Acts of John seems to be addressing Jews and pagans who were drawn to a cult of Jesus but did not want to hear that the supreme being, God, had taken human flesh and did not want to hear that he had suffered the execution reserved for slaves, i.e. crucifixion. In this text, Christ appears to John during the crucifixion to reassure him that he is not the one hanging on the cross. And in a sharp reversal of the tradition received into the canonical Gospels, on which, of course, Catholicism is founded, it is Jesus who mocks the onlookers at Golgotha. He neither suffers nor dances in the flesh because he only appears to have a body. John is able to pass his hand through the Messiah as if he were a ray of light from a higher window. So what do the earliest sources like these actually tell us? Well, by no means all of them establish beyond doubt that a sung performance is involved rather than a spoken recitation. Each instance has to be argued case by case, and the result is nonetheless a corpus of material suggesting contexts for singing that are both diverse and often convivial. Remember that word convivium in Latin means a banquet or a meal. Let's review some of the scenes, very briefly, some of the scenes of singing amongst the early Christians. There are the early morning gatherings for worship in Pontus, described by Pliny in the early second century. There's the evening meal of a community with, a chant, with chant and the lighting of lamps, described in the Syrian dossier that we know as the apostolic tradition. The singers in that instance actually are children, both male and female, and house ascetics, that is to say, people who are living a kind of anticipation of what in later centuries will become the monastic life, living without sex, uh, living with a high element of fasting in their daily life, but living in their private home. There's the Sunday liturgy in a great church at Carthage, described by Tertullian. Psalmody in the home, both Jewish and Christian, and the chanting of itinerant holy men, a most intriguing group residing with Christian or even pagan hosts for the night and singing during or after meals. Well, the arrangements for ritual singing amongst Christians, and we're still at a very early period, where they can be detected seem to be decidedly informal to the point where you might begin to question the applicability of the term ritual song. Tertullian, so we're back in Carthage, i.e. 
what's now Tunisia, around about 200, describing a shared meal says in unmistakable terms that anyone who has anything to offer from the divine scriptures or from his own devising is called into the center of the assembly to canare before God, the Latin word that should mean to sing again or to recite. There's no sense here that singing, if that's what Tertullian means, is associated with any kind of ministry. So who are the singers? Well, the singers mentioned include members of the Corinthian house churches, presumably in Paul's letter to that church, the worshippers in the churches addressed in Ephesians and Colossians, members of the primordial Jerusalem community of Christians, Aramaic-speaking Jews who'd actually looked Jesus of Nazareth in the face, a husband and wife at home, a member of the higher society of Carthage, perhaps a lawyer, children and virgins of both sexes. And there are traces of many different occasions of meals and worship here, and many kinds of singing may be audible from the minimal ability chanting perhaps implied by Pliny's, Pliny's early morning Carmen to the singing of Cyprian's gifted friend Donatus in the cool of evening in a garden in ancient Carthage, to which I'll return. In most cases, the setting appears to be domestic. I think that's very important. Domestic in the strict sense, and I'm going to come back to that, that the setting is commonly a house. Now we continue through Advent Sunday with the gradual. Universi quiti expectant non confundentur domine. They will not be disappointed, O Lord, all those that are awaiting you. The gradual was a soloist's chant, and you'll hear how much exuberant melody is put into this one. Let me introduce you to someone whom you may already know. He's a philosopher of the second century named Celsus. He's a pagan, if you like, and a wonderfully acute, a wonderfully sharp critic of Christianity. One of the charges he lays against Christians is that the officials of the communities cause a drum and a reed pipe, or aulos, to be played before worship, as priests of Cybele do, to induce a state of orgiastic frenzy. Hmm, orgiastic frenzy. Well, a biting insult loses its teeth if it has no basis at all. And the early church fathers were very eager to condemn instruments. So there may be something in the charge Celsus makes, if not necessarily in the reasons he gives for these uh, drums and repipes being used. He believed as a pagan rationalist, that nobody in their right mind 
could accept the Christian's claim about the resurrection of Jesus, so it was necessary for the priests to rob the congregation of their right minds altogether and put them in a distracted state. He may also have given some credence to rumors that Christians did hold cannibalistic or orgiastic rites, a charge often leveled against cultic groups that met in secret. Now, Celsus is in many ways a very impressive writer. He'd read, the, he'd read the scriptures at a very early stage. They're just, at the time when he read them, they were just beginning to cohere, as it were, into the fourfold gospel canon that we know. And his description of how believers gathered in shops or sought converts among artisans is no less convincing for being, as it is, both partial and contemptuous. The lesson I think one learns from his fleeing at Christian music involving drums and reed pipes, if it ever did, is that there were probably as many varieties of Christian music and performance in the first two centuries as there were competing groups who claimed the name of Christian. And it would be rash, in my view, to rule anything out as far as these early centuries are concerned on the grounds that it seems anomalous when judged in terms of later traditions. Well, from the end of the first century onwards, Christians seem to have lived in relative harmony with neighboring pagans. Pliny may have thought the Christians strange enough, but he couldn't find any law concerning them to, gu to guide him. So it seems that no relevant cases against Christians had yet been brought to trial in any law book he could find. Now, this is quickly said, and yet in some respects it's quite extraordinary. A form of monotheism with its beginnings in the teachings of an Aramaic-speaking artisan had become a faith that city dwellers could espouse among pagans and remain for the most part tolerably respectable. And the question is, how was that done? And it probably had much to do with the widespread recognition that the new faith was very quickly integrated into the fundamental uh, social unit of the Eastern Mediterranean in antiquity, the household. Now, in the Greek of both Jews and Gentiles, the word ecclesia, which gives us, of course, the word ecclesiastical, could be used with a broad sense, a gathering of people, an assembled throng. And as far as can, we can determine now, any event could temporarily become an ecclesia if the members of one or more Christian households met there as Christians. And before the third century, a church was usually just part of a, a private house and reverted to daily use when the assembly dispersed. And in fact, two of the earliest references to hymnody in Christian worship, the spiritual songs that we read about in Ephesians and Colossians, both appear in the context of advice to householders. Within three verses of counseling these spiritual songs, the author of Ephesians is advising women to obedient, be obedient to their husbands, and having elaborated that theme, perhaps with no great optimism, he turns to the duties of children who should obey their parents, fathers who should be mild to their offspring, and so on. These early references to Christian singing are part of a household code, part of the way to structure a well-run and respectable home. Well, our final extract from the Advent Sunday liturgy is the Alleluia. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Oh, 
Finally, the earliest Christian singing was often associated with meals, for we're referring to a time when the distinction between social dining and the Lord's Supper was not necessarily very sharply drawn. Consider for a moment, very briefly, the extraordinary importance of food in the ministry of Jesus. In an episode, you remember, recounted by Mark and Matthew, Jesus curses a fig tree out of season for failing to provide any fruit. What an odd episode that is. It's a most unexpected intrusion of hunger into the life of a teacher who rarely went without food unless he chose to fast, and that was a discipline that he didn't systematically enjoin on his disciples. Jesus is often presented in the fourfold gospel as a miraculous bringer of food, one who makes wine from water, can feed 5,000 persons with stores barely adequate for half a dozen. And these were blessings unlikely to be forgotten in the Eastern Mediterranean, where cities such as Jerusalem and Damascus could endure up to four months of summer drought, judged by modern figures, and where the farmer of James chapter 5, verse 7, anxiously waiting for the rains, must have been a familiar sight. You remember that Jesus was dubbed a glutton and a drunkard by his enemies because of his willingness to share meals with fiscal officers of the Roman state. And his meals in the houses of influential Jews seemed to place him somewhere between the figure of the rabbi and the Hellenistic dinner sage, issuing an invitation to a heavenly banquet. So it's no surprise that singing, eating, and worship went hand in hand amongst the first Christians. And I close with one of the most vivid descriptions of an early Christian singer. It's in the treatise Ad Donatum, Ad Tu Donatus, who may have been a lawyer or a rhetorician. And it was written by Cyprian, one of the church fathers who was writing in Carthage. So again, in what is now Tunisia. We, we cannot escape Roman Africa. The text is presented as an address to Donatus delivered in a beautiful garden in autumn. Cyprian writes in Latin and is here referring to a supper of wealthy Christians. He calls upon his friend to sing so that the hour of the evening meal will not be without the blessing of divine grace. I quote, Let a psalm sound in the frugal meal. Since you have a good memory and a harmonious voice, take on this charge, as is your custom. You will the better nourish your dearest friends if there be such a spiritual concert among us, and if our ears are charmed by a devout sweetness. Thank you very much.